And we are live. Vinny, brother, your story. Um, I first heard it on a podcast, I think, a year and a half ago. And it was so inspiring to me. I think I watched it three times or listened to it three times. And uh, my wife loved it. And I sent it to like pretty much everyone I know. So I had to reach out to you for an interview because I wanted to ask you some questions. And I also wanted my audience to be able to hear your story. So um, thank you for joining me first off. And I'll go ahead and start by asking this. I just want to get right into it. We've heard, you know, we've all heard about near-death experiences, but yours is yours is different. You were zipped up into a body bag. You were, you were literally pronounced dead, zipped up into a body bag and loaded in the back of an EMT. So what transpired to lead to that? And, and what did you experience, you know, when your physical body was zipped up in a body bag? <laughs> well, it was weird. Um, well, well, first off, you know, in the industry of, of people that have had near death experiences where most of us are part of a group called INS and, and in the group, there's a, a few different classifications and, and I'm one that they call a body bagger where technically my NDE is actually an ADE or after death experience because I did die. Um, and there's a few of them out there. There's some, some extreme ones even that uh, people have been dead days that ended up coming back. So um, yeah, it, nothing is, is final essentially with the relationship with life and death. Um, but with my experience, uh, yeah, I watched I watched a body get bagged. I didn't know it was mine, not at the time. It was it was a bit later until I realized it was actually my body. But yeah, in, in the process of me passing or my body passing, um, I aspirated. So it, it it wrecked the body. It made it look weird. It didn't look normal. And, and I was watching it from above. So for me, I thought, well, me is up here watching this. That's not me down there. That couldn't be me. So it was didn't even dawn on me till till I started to get the body revived uh, that it was actually my body. I, I didn't realize at all. Yeah. And, and what led to that? Like what led to you dying and aspirating and then being zipped up into a body bag? So a, a buddy of mine uh, and I, we both did amateur bodybuilding back this back 2003. So we were big into amateur bodybuilding and and one of the, the products that we use quite regularly was this product called Furano de Hydro. And what it did is it, it facilitated the muscles to regrow a lot faster than normal. So that if you wanted to work out your arms every day, you could. And being that it was natural, we really liked it. And in fact, most people did like it a lot back then because it was sold out everywhere you went. Um, and it was sold out so much so that you know, we were on everybody's waiting list and we weren't getting any. So we just figured, hey, let's go to the internet and find out where we can get some directly from, from a manufacturer. And we found a manufacturer in Thailand. But what we didn't realize is when you're getting stuff direct like that, you were getting a pure solution, which uh, the, the end product that you were getting in, in like the GNC and the vitamin shops around town, it was a diluted solution. So what we got was was 100% pure uh, liquid and what you're getting in the shops was a 5%, you know, uh, solution. So it was, it was like one twentieth of the strength of the pure stuff. So yeah, it, it really messed with us. As soon as we took it, we both felt really sick and decided to head down to a, a dairy queen down the street and get a bite to eat. Maybe that would make us feel better, but we barely made it inside. He barely made it inside and collapsed on a booth and started vomiting. I made it into the bathroom. And unfortunately, the bathroom was one of these little single use bathrooms. So I locked the door like, you know, like you do when you walk into one of those. And I passed out on the floor and started uh, vomiting. So I aspirated just my buddy. He was fine, though. They, they ended up taking him to the ambulance and he got got out of the hospital the next day. Meanwhile, I had my uh, my three days in heaven while I was in a coma, essentially. Wow. And so 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 when this happened, what was your first conscious experience that you remember experiencing upon your body dying? To me, it was a, it was an instant transition, instant for me. I went from recognizing that I was feeling really sick. I was feeling really nauseated and feeling like the room was getting dizzy and, and spinning on me. And, um, and then I felt this plunge and it was weird. It was, it was almost like if you could plunge your, yourself into electricity how it would feel that's what it felt but in a good way it felt um 
very cooling, but alive and electrical where I was plunged into. And out of nowhere, um, you know, it was actually just darkness that I was plunged into essentially when I, when I first passed out. And then as the body was passing, as weird as this is, I was put in like this protective place so that the body could pass where it needed to pass. Um, I didn't feel any suffocating. I didn't feel any of that at all. Uh, but, but what I did feel was just this absolute peace and comfort. And, and initially I started to see like this, this light start to form in front of me, but the light turned into an image and it was this image of this scene going on in this restaurant, this Dairy Queen. And I was watching them, you know, haul away my, my friend in an ambulance. And I was, I was hoping he was going to be okay and, and really worried about him. And, and, but what was weird is I was starting to notice I could actually hear and perceive the thoughts and feelings of everybody in that restaurant. But wow. uh, it, was, it, it felt like a movie. It really felt like a movie. It didn't feel real to me. It felt very external to me, not part of what I was experiencing. It, it felt like I was experiencing it secondhand, like a movie almost. But, uh, but yet I was interactive that I could actually feel and hear the thoughts and feelings of everybody in that, that building, that immediate building. Wow. And what were the, if, if anything, like what were the emotions going through you as this experience was happening? Well, it was weird. I felt almost like a caretaker to everything that was going on. I felt like really bad for everybody that was feeling bad. And I felt, I felt uh, a lot of like loving care for my, my buddy. I was hoping he was going to be okay as they took him away. But what was weird is as they pulled away in the ambulance, taking him away, I just knew he was going to be okay. I just knew it. I didn't know how I knew. I just knew that, okay, good. He's got the help he needed. He's going to be just fine. And, and that was very um, comforting to me. At the same time, I knew, I knew something worse was going on in that bathroom. I saw this dead body there. Again, I didn't know it was me. I, I knew it was dead because the the skin was purple and yellow. It was like really gross. And the neck was as, as wide as the jaw, if not even wider. And it was just really gross. Like you, it, it's not something that um, even movies really portray. It's just, it's disgusting. And I'm sitting there looking at it, knowing that somebody's going to have to find this body. And uh, meanwhile, there's a customer. Cause, you, cause that, you're in the bathroom, right? And so I'm yeah, assuming it was bathroom. like a single bathroom with the door locked or something yep. while you're in there. Yeah. So single door or single bathroom locked uh, and a customer, he keeps trying to open the bathroom and go use the restroom. And um, finally he goes to the manager and says, Hey, I need to go to the restroom. I've been trying for almost an hour now. Somebody needs to open that door, please. And so he, he did say that he kept hearing a phone ring in there too. So maybe somebody left their phone in there on accident and locked the door. So the manager went over there, unlocked the door and boom, there's a dead body on the ground. And, uh, he ended up uh, calling 911 again after he had already just called for the other for my buddy and called a second time. And and he kind of coached this this gal that was working for him on what to do while he talked to the medics or to the. And again, you're, medics, you're watching but, all this happen, right? This yeah, isn't a reflection from the past, like someone telling no. you afterwards. You're watching this. I'm occur watching it happen. Yeah, and, and, wow. and the whole time I can feel like the turmoil in his his persona, who he is. And at the same time, I can also feel even the turmoil. Like when the, the gal went to go touch around the neck to feel for a pulse, um, she was, she was like repulsed because the body was already starting to co like cool off. Like she felt it. She called it cold. She's like, Oh, it's cold. You know, and like, like, uh, flinched back. Um, and once, once the, uh, the person on the other line of the, of the operator for 911 heard that they said, you know what, don't bother doing anything with this body, just secure it, make sure nobody is around it and uh, wait for the ambulance to get there. So that's what they did. They, you know, the ambulance shows up, it's a, a, a training team. So it's got two veteran medics and it's got a rookie medic. This is his first week, uh, you know, working as a medic. And, and, and so is this little three man team, they, they come in and process the body, pronounce it dead. They did some preliminary, um, attempts at resuscitating the body but to to no avail of course they they bagged the body they put it in the back of the ambulance and the whole time this rookie i can hear him saying like why are we not trying harder you know why did i even get this job if i can't make a difference that kind of stuff he felt he felt a lot of remorse like why he couldn't 
he couldn't bring this guy back. And, um, and I could hear that and feel that coming off of him the whole time. And, uh, you know, fast forward a few mon- minutes later, they have all the paperwork signed uh, from the, you know, the manager of the restaurant. They had a police officer show up. So he signed some paperwork. Um, they went ahead and, and pulled away from the scene. As they're pulling away from, from the location where I was at, they had to go around kind of the back end of this parking lot to get out onto the main street. As they got into the main street, I felt this guy, this rookie, just the ache in his heart. It's really um, amazing that at this point that I was feeling like the ache in his heart that he couldn't make a difference, his heart area literally started to glow on his body. So on his physical body, like the heart area of him started to glow. From what I was seeing, um, I saw light coming from like the heart area of his body. And out of nowhere, this big, strong force, it felt like so it felt like somebody tossing a, a really fast football over your shoulder from behind you and just barely missing. That's what it felt like. It felt really this fast movement of something going over my left shoulder. And then and then I, I heard a loud voice say, this one's not dead. And and when it happened, the, the medic, he heard it. I knew he heard it because as soon as it was said, he like looked over at, at the other two medics. He thought he thought like are they messing with me? That was the first thought he had. Like, are they messing with me? And he realized, no, that's not something they would do, they would do you know? And he kind of brushed it off. Like, maybe you're just imagining it. Maybe it didn't really happen. And, and about another block down the road, all of a sudden his heart started to glow even brighter. And the glow moved from just, just his heart and started to expand and got, got a, from above his head all the way to his waist. And this light, it was so it was so bright coming from his heart space or his heart area. And then for a second time, I felt that force over my shoulder again. And this second time, uh, even louder, this one's not dead. Wow. And it was so loud that he he knew he heard it the second time. He couldn't brush it off. He knew it was real. He knew that for him, he had to do something about that. So he chose to go ahead and try to resuscitate the body at that point, and he did. He, he went through the process of uh, feeling around for a pulse, couldn't feel any in the normal spots. He went to the inner thigh where there's a femur artery or a femoral artery, which is a big one, and he went to feel for that. As he was pushing uh, for that, um, I felt a spark like an ignition or a, uh, like, uh, like a shock like a, a, a mild shock where I was, I felt it when he was feeling on the inside of the thigh there. And it was weird because I knew he felt it too. So when I felt it, I knew he felt it, but still it didn't dawn on me. Hey, that's your body. Didn't even dawn on me yet. I just am sitting here in awe of number one, the light of his around his heart, the loud voice, the fact that he's going to go ahead and take action when all logic says not to, Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just amazed at all of this, right? And so it's still not even dawning on me. But as soon as I felt that ignition, that spark, I knew something odd was going on here, like really odd. And that somehow I'm related to what's going on in front of me. So when he felt that spark, he went ahead and, and began the process of, of getting oxygen in the lungs. And he hooked up the body to a, a, a defibrillator and this, this machine that shocks the heart you know, this, this defibrillator, he, as he hooked it up, when you start it up and you, you go to do a round of shocks, it makes this really loud ringing to do like a warning, like don't touch the body when it shocks because you'll get shocked too. So, um, as this alarm is going off, all of a sudden the other two medics start going after this guy, like, what are you doing? You're going to get fired before you even are, are really hired. Like, mm-hmm. you know, they're just pretty much chewing him out. Don't do this. And he went ahead and did it anyway, let the body get shocked one time. There was no, no pulse, no heart rate. Um, and then he let it go to a second round. Um, now the medic in the front though, at this time, the, the one sitting in the passenger seat, he had unbuckled and he was getting ready to go back and stop him, like to physically wow. stop him. But what from happened their, though, from their perspective, they've been doing this for a while. And when there's no pulse, no breath, they already try to resuscitate a little bit. It, the There's no bring him back. Yeah. Especially, especially when somebody's cold and, and rigor mortis is starting to set in, like the stiffness is starting to set in. Um, even they had felt like hardness to the muscle tissue. They felt hardness to it. So they knew that, you know, th- things were past the, the point of, of resuscitation. Mm-hmm. But, but so he, he began, he unlocked, you know, undid his seatbelt and went to go move to, 
to like stop him, to physically stop him from what he was doing. But then the second round of shocks came right then. And as they did, there was a single heartbeat and then it stopped. Wow. And that was enough to like calm down that, for, that medic from even going back there. He just kind of observed for a second longer while he waited for the third round of shocks. And then the third round of shocks happened. And at the third round of shocks, there was a steady faint heartbeat, like steady on its own, no assistance. Uh, the heart started to beat on its own that, after that third shock. And part of the miracle of all this is when this all happened, um, the heart fully started less than a block from a hospital. So they were, wow. the way, you know, the trajectory of them driving to take the body and turn it in, um, the way that they were going, the path, it, it led them right in front of a hospital as the heart started. So they were able to radio and pull right in. And within seconds of the heart starting, there was a whole trauma team there ready to meet the body. So um, amazing work for, on their part too, because, it, you know, the body wasn't out of the woods yet. There was a whole lot of crap that had to go on in the body to come fully back. And, um, and during that process, I was, you know, I was in a coma for three days, essentially, and essentially brain dead for three days because there was so much time uh, oxygen starved of the brain. But, you know, meanwhile, I still didn't know it was me, not until they started to strap the body down in the hospital. So when they brought the body in, it started to go into convulsions and seizures. And as it did, they, they were strapping down the legs, strapping down the arms. As they went to strap the left arm, I felt someone restraining my left arm, like where I was watching wow. everything. I felt someone restraining my left arm. So I looked down and as I looked down, I was actually seeing the left arm of the body, like the body I've been watching for over an hour. And, and I'm sitting there like, what the hell, you know, what's going on here? And that's when I realized that, that everything I was participating in, everything that I've been seeing now for, for a while was my own death. How and, did you feel when you, when you came uh, to that realization? horrible man horrible i felt so stupid i felt so dumb how could i have been sitting there watching for you know well over an hour my own death how could i you know how can you it just doesn't make sense but that's where i was that's where i was you know i was up here watching this all happen so in no way shape or form could that have been me mm -hmm. me was up here watching you know until i realized that i'm looking down and i'm seeing the body's arm on my left and realized what i've been watching the whole time was my body and it's so like I did. You, I, you immersed with the the field of consciousness to some degree, to where you no longer had a personal attachment to that body, and then it took you a while to to realize yeah. it. Obviously, you also couldn't recognize it at the same time as well, though. And I couldn't. I couldn't. Yeah. So I was I was kind of in that etherical field of of energy as I'm watching all this happen, and and uh, as I did realize it was my body, I I spiraled fast, really to a dark space um, of fear and and just judgment, self-judgment, kind of egotistical judgment mm -hmm. of you're, you're such an idiot. How could you not know this was you? And, and as I was having those thoughts, I was having like all these flashes of anything negative I ever did in my life. And, and on top of that, not only the negative things I did, but, but like the secondary and triple secondary impacts that I saw that my negative influences had on other people and wow. their influence on other people and how the ripple effect from negative, I just saw all these things. And, and then I had this thought, like, you're not even worth it. Why, why is this all happening? Look, look at what, what failure you are. And out from that thought where I got to the end of all the failures I felt I ever had, I felt this, this, <laughs> undescribable warmth this undescribable love start to form and it formed from behind me and it felt like warmth like warmth on a on my back i was going into such a cold place that i felt like warmth was like pulling me back and mm -hmm. it came from behind me and i felt as that warm overtook me i now started to see all the in real quick flashes all the good things i did in my life and i started to see again the the ripple effect of the good that I did and, and how that affected others and how others affected others. And, and what was weird is I experienced both sides, the good and the bad from inside the people that were affected it, not from the outside, the way it happened, but from the inside of how it happened. And it was just very different. I, I had so much more empathy for, 
for myself and for them and for everyone around that that this is such a a cohesive experience of of having a mortal life here and um this warmth overtook me this love overtook me it helped me see that i did far more good than i ever did bad and 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 i got to uh really see the the potential future for myself of of good that i can i can have as influence as well so um, as that that love started to overtake me i did finally realize hey you need to turn around and see what this is all coming from and as i turned around i see this this gentleman like all dressed in white and he's it's weird he's got like a white suit on but yet he had a white robe or a stole over his shoulders too and i'm looking at him and and he doesn't look like what you would think god or jesus would look like but <laughs> but my first thought is like uh so you must be god are you god you know and 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 what i didn't realize too either is we were i communicated that without using words he just understood my thought and he laughed he like kind of chuckled and he's like i'm not god he's <laughs> like no he's like no son i'm not god but um but i'm here for you and then i i was like oh so you must be jesus then that's like my follow-up <laughs> thought and so were, were you a christian at the time too yes like, yeah okay. so i was i was raised christian so my follow-up thought was it must be jesus then if <laughs> if it's not god and and his follow-up thought was like no no son i'm not jesus either um i'm I'm here to be your guide. I'm your guide. I'm here to help you go where you want to go. I can help you go back to where you just came from, or I can help you see what's next. And, and just the thought of even looking back and seeing what was all the hell and the turmoil that was going on around the body. Um, just even looking back and seeing that I'm like, no, I don't want that at all. I want to go with you wherever you're going. I want to go with you. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said, okay, let's, we can begin our process, our journey, our traveling, and and that this traveling it's it's hard to describe it's the way he portrayed it to me is it's not just a movement from point a to point b it's a movement from lower existence to much higher existence so i really had to raise my energy i had to really raise my love energy to be able to match it to where we were going and it was going to be a process so so not only was i traveling i was going to school essentially I had to go to school. I had to learn these, these basic principles, uh, these fundamental principles so that I could even get to heaven. So that's what we did. We began our journey and, and it was amazing. That, that what was, were the uh, fundamental principles that you had to learn? So, so there's, there's uh, 10 major principles that I, I really um, fundamentally had to learn. And we could talk for hours and hours on those. But you know, just, just one of them is authenticity. I'll tell you that's the first mm -hmm. one um we can't authentically grow or love anything or anyone until we're authentic ourselves so mm -hmm. we have to we have to come to ourselves and understand that putting on a different face for anyone else is inauthentic and and i was shown how it's really beautiful in this life some of the youngest in life and some of the oldest in this life are extremely authentic and all of us in betweeners are the most inauthentic because we we think we need to put on this like certain persona for work, a certain persona for family and for friends, and certain friends this persona and certain friends this persona. And 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 we don't need to. We can be ourselves wherever we go, the same way that an 83-year-old is the same person they are wherever they go, you know? or the the three-year-old you know or the, even the five-year-old they're the same person no matter where they go they're not trying to be something that they're not um uh, not for others anyway they if they do that it's, it's for fun and for creation and for imagination you know and that that was the first principle that was shown to me is that we really have to understand authenticity mm -hmm. and how to peel away all the facades around us and be our true authentic self once we can do mm -hmm. that then we can begin our process of growth or progress uh until we can do that though we can't we can't you know progress even oh you broke up there for a second i can't hear you nope still can't hear you
we'll uh, wait a second to <clears throat> see when Vinny comes back in, but hopefully you're enjoying this story so far. I know I am. And it's really cool because as you all know, for those who follow me on social media and elsewhere, I talk about authenticity literally all the time. Like that's one of, so Vinny, I was just saying, um, one of the main things I discuss is the need to be authentic, like pretty repetitively. So it's pretty amazing that you're saying that that's one of the first principles you learned. Oh, you're still, you're still on mute. I can't hear you. Hmm. I don't know if it's your headphones. Yeah, I can't hear you. Hmm. Is it maybe, um, Vinny, maybe check your microphone to see if it's on mute, uh, like on the, on the actual restream app that you're logged into. Hold on. Hmm. Yeah, I can't, I can't hear you, huh? Hold on. Here. Sorry guys for the technical difficulties for those that are tuning in live. This stuff kind of happens sometimes. Let's see. Here, I'm going to grab my phone real quick and see if I can log in to make sure it's not on my end. One second. Hold on. People are loving this story in the comments, though, so that's good. Testing, 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 testing. testing. Yep. You have any brother? It's on your end. So I don't know what's up with the mic. Um, maybe try closing out of the app and then coming back in. Vinny, maybe try closing out and then coming back in. Yeah, because I, I still can't hear you for some reason. Yeah, I can't, can't hear you, man. Could you try uh, turning off your AirPods and then turning them back on maybe? Or then maybe like log out of the app and then log back in? Sorry, you guys, we'll get this figured out. Stuff like this happens. How about now? Nope, can't hear you. <laughs> I still can't hear you. I don't know what the heck's going on. Um, here, let's uh, let's try this. I'm gonna try to see if I it's something to do with like your microphone settings on my end, maybe. Um, nope, can't hear you. Maybe if you go into the the settings on your on your device and see if you can turn the microphone back on or like toggle it on then off or then back on. Nope, still not working. Yeah. Maybe try maybe try it without the the AirPods and see if it works. If not, we can we can reschedule this. It's all good and just pick up where we left off. Not a big deal. Sorry, you guys. I'm really stoked for you guys to hear the rest of the story, though, because it really is incredible. It's one of the most profound stories. Oh, I think it's working. I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. All right. 
Okay, I think uh, so. Where we were is you had just learned the the, the principles. You had just begun learning the principle um, of authenticity. Gotcha. Sorry, about that. it's all good, dude. It happens. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. It happens. It happens. There's a there's an air pat like uh, there's planes that fly right over my head, and once in a while there's a certain one that goes over and it'll just knock everything out. So that's probably what just happened. Okay. Sorry about it's that. It's all good. It's not a big deal. Not a big deal. No. <laughs> So yeah, essentially, I had to I had to embrace and and really empower myself through these understandings of these these ten major principles and starting with authentic. Um, the number two is is understanding the the real purpose of our life here, and that that life here is is definitely not a courtroom; it's just a classroom, oh. and we're 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 here for learning. We're here for growth. We're not here to be to be sorted as keep and throw away. That's not why we're here. We're here specifically so we can grow. That this is like a, a, a metaphysical university for us to come and learn how to create and grow. Um, and why, why do we come here is because when we were in heaven, when we were in the beginning of creation, we're right there with God and, and we are so synchronized with the creator that anything that we wanted was exactly what our creator wanted. Anything the creator wanted is what we wanted. We couldn't distinctly have our own separate necessarily intellect and choices until we had to separate ourselves from God. So we did have to separate from the creator so that we could start growing and developing ourselves um, without that influence. Because believe me, you get around that love of God, of creator, and you just want all, all good things. <laughs> you can't, it's very hard to grow when, when all you want is is good because uh where we make our our biggest leaps and and bounds and growth are when we do have the ability to choose both good and bad and, and um, so like yeah the, the appreciation and understand the depth of love that's possible when you have the contrasting like bad experiences that yes um, sort of inform that exactly yeah and then you know principle number three is i had to learn that i needed to love everyone um literally everyone the the good the bad the ugly the mean the the violent the nonviolent and and learn to to really embody a love that could could find love for any person any being out there um, and then the the fourth principle is learning to listen to my inner voice now in this space that was super easy because the inner voice was the external voice at the time you know it's the mm -hmm. the communication back and forth with my guide Drake. And um, that was super easy there, but I've really um, focused on that aspect specifically for myself to strengthen that inner voice, strengthen that inner connection to my creator so that um, I can have the creator's voice chime up on anything, anything I need. And, um, and then next was using technology responsibly. Now this is 2003, there wasn't a ton of technology at the time, but I was shown how important understanding that principle is. They're wow. recognizing that technology um, is something that could be used to build or tear down. And if you're not sure what it's doing, it's tearing down. Wow. So, so if you're not sure if your technology is hurting or helping you, it is hurting you. Because the only time it's helping you is when you know it's helping you, right? Wow. So uh, we have to be really conscious and cognizant and be very intentional about how we use our technology and then uh, number six was release prejudice and it's funny because i thought i thought i didn't wasn't prejudiced at all growing up because i had uh i have two adopted sisters from korea and and i felt like i was the least prejudiced person because i was always rushing to try to be their defender on anything and and always you know anybody who would speak out about any races i was right on them you know that you know trying to stop them thinking that i was the 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 least prejudiced person and come to find out I was prejudiced against prejudiced people. So, <laughs> so I, I had to, um, I had to eat my crow pie or, 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 you know, eat crow on that one and really understand that, that to, to think or classify any being or group of beings as, as less valuable or less important because of their choices or, or not is prejudice in itself. So, it's funny. It was the prejudice of others that was causing me to be prejudiced against them. Wow. And so I had to actually release that and, and releasing prejudice is big because it, that 
I felt a lot of accelerated movement once I did that. I felt that we were able to move a lot faster, a lot better once I released the prejudice. And then uh, the principle seven is exercising the power of creation and, and understanding that it begins with our thoughts, that our thoughts literally become our actions. Our actions uh, become our habits. Our habits become our character and our character literally becomes our direction or our destiny of where we go in our life. And so it begins that we create with our thoughts first. So in mastering the power of creation, we first must master the power of thought. You know, you know, foster positive thoughts, you'll foster positive creations. And we are all creators. We create our own universe. We create our own environment. We create our own version of our virtual reality that we're all existing in. Um, and so that leads us to point eight, which is avoiding negative influences because, you know, knowing how important those thoughts are, it's important you understand the threats to those positive thoughts and that's the mm -hmm. negative influences and recognize what the negative influences are for you. It's going to be different for every single one of us, but recognize where those negative impacts are and avoid them so that you can avoid them when you want to, when you want a better, better, higher frequency existence then avoid those negative influences. And then that led me to number nine, which was almost got me to heaven, but to understand that there's literally purpose in evil, that even, even having evil in our life is, is very purposeful because if we didn't have evil, we wouldn't have necessarily good. We wouldn't have the, the opposite choice without the, so without the, the bad, we wouldn't have the good. And it's important for us to have both. So we get to be the agents of our own movement. We get to have agency. We get to own our growth, whether we, we choose the light or we choose the dark. It's important to have both. And then and reflect, lastly, reflecting back, just a quick one on that one, because that's so significant right now, um, especially for my audience. And, uh, and I've said this before, too. Um, when I look back on the bad things that happened to me in my life, I actually mm -hmm. reflect on them positively because they propelled me into more introspection and understanding of myself and into positive uh, action. Like even with what's happened these last, you know, th uh, three years, all opinions aside on it, like it was a very traumatic experience in and of itself. And that propelled me into more positive action, more introspection, more authenticity in my life. So it's using these very negative, perceptively evil experiences as a mm -hmm. tool for good on the individual and collective level. Well, it's kind of funny if you, if you go into understand metallurgy or how you work metals, the only way to clean a metal up is to fire it, to put it in the furnace, right? Mm -hmm. The only way to separate the slag or the, the bad stuff in the metal is to, is to melt it, to put it in the furnace. And sometimes when we're in life, it, it takes that, that furnace moment uh, and things can be scary, but it's allowing us to see the separation of good and, and darkness, mm. you know, um, uh, of seeing the light and the darkness showing up in, in our, our, our lives. And whenever somebody says, isn't this horrible that this such and such and such is happening? I, I tend to, I try to respond saying, well, isn't it awesome that, that the creator has an answer even greater than that that's already mm. in play mm. because, because, you know, no matter how scary or bad the world is, um, the creator has even stronger, you know, scary and good ways, uh, light forces out there working the, the opposite. And one thing you'll learn about a pendulum, anytime you swing it one way, it always has to go the other way, mm -hmm. always. So mm -hmm. don't worry, don't sit there and fret and worry as someone's pulling that pendulum one direction or another, just understand there will always be balance, always mm -hmm. be balanced. But we do need to again, go back to listening to that inner voice, because sometimes that force, that energy to bring balance into the universe is us. So it's important for us to have that inner voice. So we know the right steps and actions when, when we receive the messages, you know, um, which that, that leads me to the final principle, which is knowing that we are all one, that even though there is great evil and there is great good, we are all part of, 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 the creator's hands that we're all fingers on the creator's hands. So for me to be over here and hate uh, over here is to only hate self that I only hate myself. If I hate any, any of the other fingers on, on the creator's hands, even if they're labeled as evil or good or bad, I, I, I don't hate them. 
And would you um, would you say that um, in large part evil actions take place or people commit evil actions because they miss that understanding because they perceive those quote other people as separate of them when in reality those other people are one with them well it's funny here's what's weird is you can get into this life so much and understand the the psychology of this but hurt people hurt people Mm -hmm. victims make victims not all the time um i was one that i was i was victimized a bit as a as a kid and and raised raised a little bit in a rough upbringing and um and i i chose to to end that cycle with me but i also died too so it was much easier once i crossed but i did you know prior to my my experience i was i had very violent tendencies um inside of me and it was Mm -hmm. because of that darkness that i allowed to be uh input into me but i've realized since that you know the the love of the creator can fill up any hole fill up any gap that there's there's not a a um there's not a price that won't be paid you know we don't have to worry about that what we do need to worry about is how we love and how we love everyone because that's the most important thing we can learn to do here is learn how to love but it starts with ourselves though we have to love ourselves Hmm. yeah and in, in, in the another follow up question I have to that real quick, and then I want to get into the rest of the story because it is it, it's incredible um, is as a Christian, when you were taught these principles, when you're up in the afterlife and in, in heaven, um, was it hard to, to wrap your mind around the understanding that we are all one? No. Um, and here's the reason why it wasn't is because. Um, a lot of Christian faiths believe that they are one body of Christ, the way they follow Christ. And so they are one in that nature. So to me, I just realized that even though as Christians, we kind of build a fence of believer and non-believer and inside the fence, you're part of the body of Christ and outside the body, outside the fence, you're not. Um, I realized that, that our creator has even a bigger fence that has all of us in it and uh, really has a purpose and a love for all of us. Um, but what's great too, is, is amazing. I love my, my path and my, my belief, my religion is Christianity and stays there. Um, beautiful. I, I still feel that, that Christ is my path to my creator and my savior. Um, you know, my savior is my, 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 my path to my creator. And I realized too, though, that, that up in heaven, there was many, many, many cultures there already that didn't believe in Christ. Now, but what's cool, though, is they they did have to bend knee or accept um, the price that was paid for them to get there. They didn't have to 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 believe the name, the the worldly name of of Christ, which Christ means anointed. You know, they didn't need to believe that they they just had to believe that 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 path was there, that loving savior path or the Christ consciousness is is what allowed them to get there. Um, but everybody's on their own individual path. There's not a written off congregation of earth. There's not a written off religion of earth that God's not there saying, I love all of you except for them. That's not how it is. No matter what our preachers teach us, um, God loves every like, like we have no idea, like how much the creator loves every single one of us, like so much. And when you look at the creator, you look at all the different creations of the, of, of all the, the worlds and universes and, and the cosmos. And you look to what God cares about the most. It's us here right now. God cares about every single one of us so much. There's not one that God doesn't care about. There's not one. And that's really important for us to, to know. And no matter what box we check for religion, you know, or not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change that fact that God loves us so much. And, uh, and that was a big thing for me, extremely big thing for me to learn that, that the creator has a path for everyone, for everybody. So it sort of recontextualizes the, the body of Christ to be really the body of Christ is all of us. It is. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Now, now, Those who don't embrace it, they don't have to embrace it. Everything is always agency. It's Mm -hmm. just the Christ, the Christ path, the the path of of our savior is the path to God. 
and we get to go along that path as long as, as far as we're comfortable. And if we're not comfortable going there, we don't have to. That's the beautiful thing. So, so if we need that distance from creator because it's our choice, we get to have it. But we get to lovingly have it, not judgment have it, not throw them away have it. We get to have it because we lovingly choose it. And, and once we decide we're comfortable at a certain distance or closeness to God, it's not over. We're in this eternal progression where we can continue to grow and progress and get closer and closer to God as we, we achieve and believe and, and embody the, the creator, the love of the creator, then we get to get closer. It's, it's never like we reach this end level and it's like all over with for the rest of eternities. You're now stuck at like level 13 away from God. It, does, it doesn't happen. It's not possible. It, we're in an eternal progress with our father, with our creator. And we get to go along that path where we're comfortable. Grace takes us a little bit further. And then, then, we're, then we stay there until we're ready to move forward or backward. It's always our agency. It's wow. always our choice all along the way. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That's, I'm like almost like speechless. It's really beautiful to hear because I've been wrestling with a lot of the same thoughts myself coming from an evangelical Christian background to throwing it all away to sort of returning back to it more lately. And my wife and I have been attending church again. And it's just like such a beautiful thing to hear what you've just said. But um, I, I, so I, I want to get to the rest of the story now. So your guide, Drake is his name, right? That's your guide. Yeah. So he takes you in into heaven. And yep. what was that experience like? So part of, part of, uh, I was finally getting that, that last principle of knowing that we're all one as, as I did, he helped me understand that, that heaven is all one as well. And how there are separate energies and, and consciousnesses there that even a single blade of grass has its own consciousness, but yet it's also part of the, the collective love of, of the creator, the same way I can be and the same way that, um, that all of us can be. And when we're really functioning in the, in the peak performance of love frequency, meaning we're doing selfless things the way that Christ did, the way that, that um, we can go out and serve and care and love each other, that's when we are really embodying that love frequency of the creator because that's the love that created us and created this whole universe. Um, and, and that's how we're all one. We, all are, we have a spiritual umbilical cord connected to our creator it's from within though. It's not from without. So we are going to find God stronger within than we will ever find God on the outside. Uh, when we go to find God on the outside, we tend to look to other, other people to find God. And we, we rest on their laurels. We rest on their beliefs. We rest on their testimonies of, of God, right? But yet uh, the, the holy of holies, the greatest temple on earth is right here these temples right here the temples on your head what you allow in here is more important than what you could ever do out here because that's where we start to build our universe is right here first mm. and it's so important for us to master that first to really be to embody the love creation in there first and 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 that's why i began to learn as i i touched down and started to actually experience heaven. I got to see just the grass was so amazing. Like if I could, if I could even get one of those blades of grass here, number one, a single blade would explode this entire planet. It's so full of this energy of love that it's more than this planet can take right now. But, but I'm telling you like the light that came from within this grass the the sweet aroma and flavor that was just just to be there touching it i could taste it and and you would actually hear like the there's this loving music coming off of it just to even be near it you could actually feel this music coming off of it it was almost like a when you listen to the 528 hertz yeah whew, i can't really struggle this i'm sorry yeah but just being there and feeling this like it overtakes you and, and not only does it overtake you like your being starts vibrating at the same music that they're making and you're, you're, you're vibrating together in frequency or in unison or in, in kismet you're synchronizing and, and just the grass alone. If I could get the world to even understand just the basics of heaven, we would change everything we do mm -hmm. here. 
we would change everything we do here, how we talk to each other, how we care for each other, how we drive around each other, how we care for our planet, how we care for our kids, how we care for what we use and resources, and how we would love everything, love everything. We would love that people are good and bad. We would love it all. Um, and that was just the grass, just the grass. I'm <laughs> just just the grass. The grass. <laughs> you are crying. I'm crying because you're describing the grass. But my goodness. And that's just the, the stinking grass, man. I can't even <laughs> begin to tell you like what the flowers were like. Most times when I even get in a description of flowers, I have to be in a pr very private environment because I get really, really, and I'm not an emotional guy, but man, to, to discuss this stuff, it's just so, it really is such a beautiful thing. And we all get this, by the way, like we all get this. We all get to go there. If, if we release our, if we release our own prejudices, especially against ourselves, if we really release that, that, that self-hate and, and embrace the self-love that the creator has for us, we can get there. It's, it's just a matter of our choice and our desire and, mm -hmm. and really embodying, embracing that love as, and the path of the Christ, the, the Christ consciousness to get there. We can mm -hmm. all get there and experience just the grass if we want to. But, but like I said, that's just the basics. That's just getting there. And that's, that's environmental to what we get to experience for the eternities. And, and I got to experience water and the healing power of water and how, um, you would even get near the water and the water would ask, do you want me to, to come on to you, like get on you? And I'm like, yeah. And it would like, just come up to you and like, just start washing away any of those like little empty spots that were in my energetic body. You know, they would just wipe away the harm that, that life had put in me and, um, and just erase it or really clean it up and heal me. Um, and in the process, um, you know, I got to this point where I was just, I was just in awe as I looked around and saw trees and I saw this, this hill and I saw on top of this hill, this big building and, and somehow I knew it was like a university and, and there was all these very energized and happy and loving people going in and out of this building, um, learning stuff and, and learning all the eternal truths, the, the truths without the manipulations of man. Uh, which is very different than the truths we learn here because <laughs> yeah, the truths we learn here are written by, by, by us, not by God necessarily, you know, mm -hmm. um, even when we receive scripture, it's scripture from God through a human, through a, a prophet or a mankind. Right. So it's, it's still sometimes can be um, construed or, or constrained. So it's really a beautiful thing there in this university. We get to learn eternal truths and we get to stay there as long as we want. And then there's also other parts of heaven. I knew they're there. I knew of them. I, and somehow just being there, you just know that all these other parts of heaven exist. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't allowed to go there because uh, if you were to kind of uh, see heaven as this glorious place as it is, where I got to go is kind of like the, the leeway station or the, the, the way you get to see it, but not be all the way there. And, and I essentially got to the extent of where I was going to be able to go when my guide got real close to me and said, Hey, Vinny, um, this is going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. And he gave me this hug. And um, this hug is something that we don't get to experience here. I mean, it's what we're copying when we hug each other here, but there, because you're an energetic body, you're not limited by these low densities bodies that we carry around these, these meat suits that we live in here. Um, and you're able to take your two energies that are separate and actually come together to be one. Oh. And as you do your, your space or, or the space you take up, it goes four times what you would be by yourself. So it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but you're, like I'm here, he, he came in to hug me and all of a sudden we went boom and we expanded wow. and, and the two of us together were four times larger in energy than we were before we came together. And I was shown that, that that's the beauty of creation, that when we do come together, we have so much more impact. And that's why it's so important for us to understand that we are all one in, mm -hmm. in the creator's body, that as we come together and we care for each other and take care of each other, our impact is four times what it could ever be by ourselves. And, um, and that was the last thing that, uh, 
that I remember from that side, because as I was in that, that hug with him, I started to hear, I started to hear the words of my brother, which me and my brother always had a really rough, like childhood. We were two years apart, but very close in size. Mm -hmm. So we were always fighting, like physically (laughs) fighting all the time. And I didn't realize how much he loved me and I didn't realize how much I loved him. But all of a sudden I hear these words of my brother and he's saying a prayer over my body in the hospital. Now, granted, this is three days I've been brain dead in a coma in the hospital. And my brother says this, this blessing or this prayer over my body and says that I'll be made whole and that I'll return. And when he said that to me, it was instant. Like my agency was removed completely. I had no more agency. And that force of that love that my brother was using was stronger, far stronger than my agency. Wow. And it forced, it forced me back into my body. Wow. So my brother, he said this prayer over my body around probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. And then I woke up at 1, 11 in the morning, like on the dot. My, all, of my, all my sensors 1-11. went off at wow. 1, 11 in the morning because I pulled off everything. As soon as I woke up, I was so claustrophobic, I yanked everything off of me. And so like the, the little um, reader for your heart, it all went flat line right at 111. <laughs> so, so if there was a second time of death, it would have been 111 because I pulled all this stuff off me. Yeah. What, and I wouldn't, my... I wouldn't let him put it back on me either. I was extremely claustrophobic. You're like, I'm alive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, yeah. what, so one of, my, one of my friends that I have had an um, experience practicing Qigong where she talks about she – it was sort of an out of body experience where she talked about coming back into her body. She felt somewhat claustrophobic too, because it's like, how can I fit all that I really am back into what back into this fleshy suit? We are so much larger. So our spirit body is like the size of a house. I'm not kidding. So who we really are, because what we're seeing ourselves as here is not who we really are, who we really are, who our energetic body is, is the size of a house, legitimately the size of a house. And it's like squashed down and imp- compacted to live inside these meat suits, you know? And and I think that's why we have to come as babies and why babies cry a lot because they're like kind of pissed that <laughs> they were like crammed into this little <laughs> tiny thing. And, um, but also it, it makes sense too, why they, they're not allowed to talk right away. Otherwise they'd have some stories to tell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because you know that that transition itself is is pretty rough i yeah. i right right off the bat i came back i was extremely suicidal i was didn't want to be there i wanted to go back to heaven heaven is such an amazing place that once you're there like you're like really you know it's kind of like uh taking a kid from a third world country put him in disneyland with with unlimited budget they can just do whatever they want for a few for three days and mm-hmm. then they say okay now put on these handcuffs we're going to put you in this little solitary consignment cage and you're going to live the rest of your life there. And I'm like, no, I wanted to go back. So I was, I was, I was, uh, I was pretty rough for a while until uh, about two and a half months until I met my wife. Once I met her, then I, then I knew you literally met your wife two months after this experience. Yeah. Literally met her, met her. uh, So actually about three months, about three and a half months total from the time that I died and then I met her. Um, but as soon as I did though, I, all of a sudden the depression started to go away. And here's the reason why is when I first met her, like I literally saw like the light that I was experiencing in heaven, which is so much brighter than what our eyes could even perceive here. I was seeing little glimmers of it in this girl that I had just met. I'd never met her before. And, and every time we would sit down and talk, I was just amazed. And I would listen to what she was saying and I would talk. Like I would allow my body to talk back and forth to her, but I would, I would almost kind of pull my consciousness up and observe outside and say, what's going on here? Like, I don't understand this. Like there's a lot of light going on in between these two and it's wow. freaking me out here, <laughs> but, it, <laughs> wow. but it was, an, it was enough of a distraction that it kept me away from the dark side of, of thought, you know, and, mm. and kept me in the light. And, and uh, it was, you know, she was my saving grace and still is every day, my saving grace. And, um, and yeah, so that we've, we've essentially built a family 
together and uh she was she was what helped me stay here once i got back here yeah wow that is incredible i, I want to get into more of the integration back onto onto earth but there's something that i heard you say before on on another time that i've listened to you and you talked about on heaven's gates these sort of healing pods or or something like that 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 yeah. spirits would could you touch on that a little bit yeah so as we were approaching heaven we were around like in between principle eight and nine, when I was perceiving heaven very strongly and, 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 you know, that's avoiding the negative influences and understanding the purpose of evil. As I was going through that part of my traveling, I noticed that around this place I was looking at was this, that was heaven. It looks like a huge planet. that's way larger than, than our sun. Like you could fit multiple suns inside this place. It's so huge. And as I'm perceiving this space, this place, that I'm, I'm thinking is heaven. I noticed that there's like this haziness. It's like this wide belt of haziness around the outside. And as I got closer and closer, I asked my guy, Drake, I'm like, why is that like a cloud? What is that? That's going around the outside of heaven. And he's, and he helped me. And he's like, no, this is built out of love. Let me show you this. So he let me see in what was going on and what the haziness was. It's built of these like energetic pods. These, some might call them pearls, like it's a pearly gate. Hmm, wow. That's kind of odd. These pearls, these energetic um, spheres that souls are in. And, and there's a few souls in each one, but inside, like the, the one that I was seeing was, was this gentleman that he felt betrayed by his son. And he felt like it, the betrayal itself is what ended his life. So he was there like cussing out his son in his own mind, in his own consciousness. He was, he was seeing his son's face and he was just like, and he was speaking Italian. He was from like the, the late 1800s, early 1900s from the United States. So I could, I could perceive that just from what he was wearing and, and how he, he kind of uh, perceived himself. And he was going off, just going off in Italian. And even though he's going off in Italian, I could understand what he was meaning. And he was just really cussing out his son. Finally, he got to the point where he had said enough. He had finally said enough. And when he did, he like, he kind of like expelled that negative energy out of him. And he took this like deep breath. And then he started looking around like this, like, oh my God, like what, where am I? And as soon as he did that, light just boom, 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 all around him came together around him. And it was angels they they escorted him onto the heaven space so so what these pearls are the you know some people might call it purgatory they may call it whatever they want but they're built out of love and light they're there to help um uh exercise negative energy out of us expel negative energy out of us because we can't synchronize with heaven or be in the heaven space while we carry those negative thoughts even if it's towards self, towards anything else. We can't carry that and be in heaven. But if we want to go in heaven, then we can we can push through that. We can cleanse it with our own guides, with our own angels. But in this particular instance, it was the prayers of, of loved ones that were helping, even though it was wow. probably those who had said those prayers had already crossed into heaven by dead. Um, those prayers were still working. They're timeless. And that's what was, now yeah, they're timeless. So they were facilitating this process for this gentleman. And then not only that, I got to see this, this, this woman in kind of the same experience towards her daughter and, and saw, and I saw a glimpse of that. And then I was pulled away because I, I got a grasp of what was going on in there. And then I realized that that's what these pearls are. That's what the pearly gate is. It's a gate, not preventing us from getting in heaven, but preparing us for getting in heaven, which is also goes back to classroom, not courtroom. Yeah, it's that's what this is all about is is that pearly gate is there for us to help us, you know, exit the negative energies off of us. What's funny, too, though, and really beautiful is when there's traumas um, exercised on us here uh, in the physical form that can make it kind of hard for us to get in heaven as well. So in heaven itself, there's these half domes, so these half orbs and they're on heaven and they're for people that receive trauma from someone else that they they are having a little bit hard time to release they can get to that high frequency love frequency but maybe not necessarily for that being that that did that to them so these these half pods are to help them even release and 
and allow forgiveness there because yeah. forgiveness is just poison that we drink that only hurts us. It doesn't hurt anybody else. So, so if, if we can't forgive, then, then we're drinking poison. And, yeah. um, and it's a life force that if we allow forgiveness, it, it, we can drink that light, we can drink that love and it helps us and, and helps us more than it could ever help anyone else. Um, but yeah, that was, that was part of what that, those pearls were is, is, you know, the pearly gate is built mm-hmm. out of love and built out of angels to help us. What I, what I find fascinating about what you described also bringing in the experience of your brother praying over you in the, in the love that is, um, you know, very evident in that experience, right? Your brother's praying over you and that sort of pulled you back into the body. And then what's helping heal these people that are inside the pearls on the, on the pearly gates, right? Is these prayers of loved ones, the love from those prayers that is then helping them heal. And it's really cool to think about the, the, um, how love is, is, you know, permeating from, permeating heaven all the way from earth and back oh, and yeah. forth if you were and to me love and ether are the same so to me the ether that is found everywhere is that love and um people can can call it dark matter whatever you want <laughs> yeah. we were just matter. having this conversation literally it's, last night with my wife it's just love it's just love yeah. it's god's love and it is inexplainable but what's funny is the reason why you, you know the power of the atom bomb is splitting the atom um because what's inside the atom is, is, is so powerful. Mm. God is inside the atom. Mm. And that's why it, that's why there's so much expanse that comes out because it's taking that very high energy that exists in everything and releasing it. And yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Um, And that's why it's a big deal Mm. right there. That's why it's a big deal. It's so crazy you brought that up because I was literally having the conversation about dark matter last night and saying that it's really ether, literally just to my yeah, wife last love. night with documentary we were talking, watching. But um, okay, so so to wrap up, I, I want to get to um, the integration back on Earth. You met your wife, and then how have you since integrated all of these teachings into your life? How did it transform you from who you were before to who Vinnie Tolman is now? So it's still a process. It's never, it's, it's just like life. It's not like I reach this certain level. I'm like, okay, I'm good. No need to grow anymore. Cause every time I think like, okay, I think I'm doing pretty good. Then, then I have a new teacher that comes out of the word work for me, you know? Yeah. Um, and I start learning a new aspect that really implements what I already know from my, exi- my experience and helps me better embody it. And so, um, yeah, my, my process and my journey is continual and I'm, I, I, I do train people um, where I'm really good, where there's certain things I'm really good at. So I do train people and I do coaching and stuff for people on, on certain aspects, but, but um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, tend to want to coach anybody on certain things that I'm not a master of yet. And, but my journey, it's been amazing. It really has, has it been easy? No way. It's just exactly how Drake mentioned it, Mm. that it's, it's not going to be easy, but it'll be worth it. And it has been worth it just the the beautiful the beautiful blessings i've been able to to experience here and there but i love though i love the feeling that no matter what's going on in the world worst case scenario someone wants to threaten my life i'm like good i'm <laughs> i'm ready to go back <laughs> you know you, you no like, longer really have like this there's, there's no anymore, leverage so. yeah there's no leverage in trying to threaten my life or or the lives of, of those around me because i know i know the powers on the other side that are in protection even in the traumatic crossings mm-hmm. that um someone cannot have leverage over you over your life or the life of your loved ones no matter what they can't because How there's so there's so much protective force in that love that surrounds you as a being, as a part of, of the creator here, because we are all fingers on the creator's hands, every single one of us. Vinny, this was such a beautiful conversation, brother. I, I laughed and I cried and I felt sad. I felt happy. <laughs> it was great, man. So, and we had you. the dra- and we had the technical drama too. To, <laughs> yeah, it had to everything. Get the, <laughs> it, was, it was perfect. <laughs> get the sound um, to work out. <laughs> yeah, it was good. No, it was perfect. And uh, thank you so much for joining me. And for, for those that are watching, Vinny will be joining us. Um, for the, for those that are members of the Way Forward on the 22nd of December for a, for a Q and a. So 
looking forward to that. And uh, Vinny, I got to say again, man, this was such a transformative conversation. And I've listened to you speak before, but even just this conversation was just so, ah, just like such a, such a breath of love and relief and, and just knowing what waits for us on the other side of this, this seemingly finite experience. It's, it's beautiful. So is there anything else you want to say to, to close well, up? I would, I would like to say, if you feel like there's gotta be more, because I think that's a real sense that the world is getting right now, there has to be more to this life. And that's the secret. There is a lot more to this life. And, and if you feel the monotony of the day to day, turn off your phone, leave it at home, go away from your technology, give yourself a technology fast here and there, master your relationship with technology. And that's going to allow you to master your thoughts, mm -hmm. but technology in itself becomes the master of your thoughts. If you allow it and it will do it on its own, you don't even have mm -hmm. to try, it will do it on its own. And, and then others are going to be controlling you. You won't be in control of yourself. You you'll be the the clay in in another maker's hands, and if you don't want to be the clay in anyone else's hands but the creator, and realize that you are the creator, then first master your relationship with technology. Seek out good things like this. Seek out the good stuff. Seek out the light forces and and stay away from the darkness of any form, uh, as you can, as you recognize it, and that will change your life. That will change your life, and I call it the hour of power. Um, mastering the 30 minutes before you go to bed in the first 30 minutes when you wake up make sure in that sacred space there's only room for light there's only room for your relationship with your creator uh, your relationship with those around you those who you care for so if you're a religious person say your prayers do your scripture study there really connect your creator there if you're not a religious person do breathing do do meditating do grounding do sun gazing but connect to life in these spaces and you will you will begin to sanctify and bring bring uh, kismet or synchronicity, beautiful synchronicity to your life uh, as you honor your hour of power because it's a blessed space and don't allow technology in there unless you're consciously seeking you know high frequency, high light um, content in your hour of power. Um, but yeah, that's that's my two bits, man. I, I want to be a force for good out there like you are, like you're what you're doing, you know, you're helping wake people up and bring them um, a higher understanding that, that uh, we are higher beings living in these meat suits running around bumping each other and being mad at each other. We don't need to do that. So, so yeah. thanks. Thank you for all you do too, Alec. I really appreciate you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. That means a lot coming from you. And thank you for that recommendation. It's a, uh, it's beautiful because, you know, various religious teachings actually talk, talk about that, uh, that hour early in the morning, uh, in the, in the time spent with the creator. So it's really beautiful to see you share the same thing. So thanks again for joining me, Vinny. And if you want to check out more on Vinny's work, please go to livinggodslight.com. See you guys.